Well, I just want to welcome everybody to our Business Advisory Council meeting this morning. Hopefully, you've been able to grab your coffee or your caffeinated beverage of choice. Hopefully, soon we'll be able to have these meetings in person again. But until then, we're very appreciative that we have this um, method of being able to, to get together. So um, we do have a full agenda today. Um, I do want to let you know that we're going to be muting everyone just so that everyone can have a good listening experience, but we are going to be utilizing the features of below that Mark has on the screen now, which include the chat function as well as being able to raise your hand, I believe. Um, so with that, um, when you do put something in the chat box, we're going to try and go through the presentations uninterrupted so that we can make sure we get through all of our material, leaving plenty of time for questions because we do know that we will have questions about these topics. Um, if you want to reference a slide number, just so that once we do get to the Q&A portion of the meeting, um, we'll be able to quickly um, get to where we were when you had the question. So uh, reference a slide number, um, use the chat function, use the raise hand function, and hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions. And with that, I would like to introduce Kevin Wales, our CEO for an executive update. Thanks, Lisa. Um, thank, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I, I went back and looked at the last time we had uh, one of these meetings and that appears to be in September of last year, probably around budget time. Uh, quite a bit has happened since there, I think to all of us. So I'm not going to go through a bunch of detail, but I want to hit a couple of highlights. Uh, you'll notice the, the screen background I have actually is our new operations center, which is actually the phase two portion of the offices in the background. Um, basically, we had the certificate of occupancy for that in early uh, December and started moving people in slowly uh, to the office. We're still not complete with that. Uh, and in part, uh, you might recall also that we had phase one, which included, in effect, the service center portion of this facility uh, was, was actually occupied in April of 2019. When we originally conceived this project, which started uh, the actual construction started in 2015, uh, it was to be predominantly both risk, uh, focused on basically risk mitigation for us, uh, but we had a vision at that time that the risk mitigation was going to be for something like, a, let's say, a tornado hit the other service center and took out all of our facilities, equipment, materials. Um, and of course, there's growth. And then there was response time because this having uh, one facility in the northwest and one in the southeast. What we didn't realize, of course, was that, that risk mitigation, how well that would play uh, in a pandemic event. And so that gave us the ability to have our crews split easier when we were separating shifts, doing a variety of things, and even in fact, separating more people than we had uh, before. So this actually turned the first major use of this facility actually was uh, associated with significant risk mitigation for us in our operations in the last year. Um, we have moved in, um, but it's also interesting that we did that in portions. And just a quick piece about uh, how we were dealing with the pandemic itself. Um, we had basically in March of last year, most of our uh, people that could work from home moved from home, moved to work from home, which was about 50%. Uh, uh, all the executive staff stayed in, but everybody else that could work from home did. Uh, we brought them back basically in early August. Um, then in just a, a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, we made, had a, basically made an offer for those people who would be more comfortable working from home and could do their jobs from home, uh, that, that they voluntarily could do that. And that ended up being about 25% of the workforce. So basically since mid-January, we've been bringing people back slowly. We've been anticipating by the end of April, we'll actually have uh, everyone back in the workplace again. Uh, so that's kind of where we've been through the work from, from the, the pandemic process. Um, another major, uh, basically, event that took place, and I think you probably saw the um, media coverage on it, was the board did op, uh, basically approve and adopt a decarbonization goal uh, in November of last year, after about one year of going through an awful lot of uh, sessions and work about different impacts of technology. 
uh, climate change, uh, basically the markets and how they worked and how they'd impact. Uh, and that was going to be the topic of the session today until three weeks ago when we had the cold weather event. Uh, I thought I would not get into the detail on decarbonization because that'll be the topic of our, our next meeting. But what I wanted to briefly hit was something I think is a question that comes out of this and that we've heard and the industry's heard of, well, how, how is decarbonization goals going to be impacted when you look at what happened in the cold weather event? Uh, most particularly, I wanna read the second part of this resolution. And it basically says that, um, be it further resolved by the LES Administrative Board that the ultimate path and pace to achieving such a goal, and the goal, by the way, is to be net zero carbon uh, production from our generation portfolio by 2040. But the ultimate path and pace to achieving a goal must be balanced by continued commitment to maintaining high uh, electric system reliability, environmental stewardship, a fiscally responsible focus that carefully considers financial impacts to all customers, especially LES customers with low and fixed incomes, consideration of existing contractual obligations and advancements in generation energy storage, carbon capture, and other emerging solutions. So uh, I guess my answer to people's concerns about whether this goal will impact our reliability in the future is that was recognized by the board when they set the goal. We recognize it's a very ambitious undertaking uh, and we don't take that lightly and still need to maintain reliability through that. Uh, rather than talking on and on, I'm gonna to get to the cold weather portion of this. I wanna do a quick uh, introduction. I think many of you have um, familiar with what the Southwest Power Pool is, but it's obviously come into play a lot in this event. Uh, before I get into that, I wanna thank all of you, not only for your patience as we were going through that event, uh, but your support. I think there are, I believe seven uh, of the 10 companies that, that actually ran generation during the event, I believe are in attendance or representatives are in attendance. Uh, in addition, we had companies offering to reduce loads and doing so uh, as we went through that event. Um, it's important to note for us uh, that we were actually generating for the majority of that time, we were generating more than our load in support of the grid as well. So keeping the, the lights on was not only that extra generation, but those conservation uh, measures that everybody was, were taking as well. Uh, just briefly on the Southwest Power Pool, um, many of you may know this, but Southwest Power Pool is a regional transmission organization of which we're a member. It's got, uh, this portion of it is 14 states, uh, reaching from Canada, North Texas. And I emphasize North Texas because the bulk of Texas is not in SVP. It's a separate entity as you may have continually read lately, uh, ERCOT. So the Southwest Power Pool uh, has you know, basically a few <clears throat> major um, tasks. And one of those is it serves as a balancing authority. Uh, balancing authority is, is basically when you balance the amount of generation you have with the amount of load. Uh, it used to be, uh, prior to 2014, LES did that ourselves. For our, so we would look at a forecast, we'd bring on generation, buy power or sell power, and balance load generation and our other commitments. Uh, this is now done on a 14-state basis, and the advantage to that is, of course, trying to select the lowest cost resources to serve all of the load. Um, Basically, the second piece is that reliability coordination, and that's basically to maintain the reliability of the grid. There's another part of that. Their uh, RTO is market operations, and so they run the markets uh, just on a, and we've talked, I think, a little bit about this over the years, but basically, you know, every five minutes, the market is settling. We basically bid our, our resources into the market. Uh, SPP selects the, the resources that need to run in order to, to basically be the most financially advan advantage for the members. But in turn, uh, they also have to balance that reliability component. Um, and they also do transmission planning on a long-term basis and, and that's for that entire footprint. So a lot of the advantages we've gotten out of SPP over the years includes really the ability to, you know, the renewables we have in Oklahoma or Kansas uh, probably would not have been as easily uh, attained and integrated into our system, but for being able to do that through SPP. Uh, we also, as you know, have resources in Wyoming, we have resources in Iowa. Uh, so the SPP helps us in many ways balancing those issues, but there's also this issue that, you know, if we have generation that's down for maintenance, uh, we no longer have to be out there separately trying to acquire resources to back it up. 
because the, basically SPP backs that up for us. Or if we have an instantaneous event where generation would go out, basically SPP is there behind us. And I bring that those pieces up because there seems to be some question like, why would we be um, you know, putting more power into the grid when we were having outages locally? And that basically was to keep the grid stable. Uh, the If you look back to the 2003 timeframe when the Northeast blackouts impacted 60 million people, that was because of the cascading event uh, that was caused because basically the grid collapsed there. Those are the kinds of, of electrical events that SPP works to prevent. Um, so that's, that's the challenge. The other challenge to that is uh, whether or not SPP existed, we have a responsibility for grid reliability. Um, if, for example, when SPP asks us to interrupt load, and both Paul and Jason are gonna go through that whole process here in a little bit, if we did not do that, we could be subject up to a million dollar a day penalty per violation. So there, there is a lot behind uh, basically making sure that we don't have those kinds of events that happened uh, you know, 17 years ago in, in the Northeast. Um, and then I guess the other quick thing I want to mention is you all heard through the news uh, what, about energy emergency alerts. Um, there are really four categories for SPP. Uh, they first go into conservative operations and conservative operations in effect just means, hey, we know that there's a lot of stuff going on that could impact generation and loads. So everybody needs to kind of, kind of be paying attention. And then they've got three levels of emergency alerts. The first one uh, in effect says all generation is in use that's available. The second one basically says they're, they're deploying load management and curtailment uh, with, throughout the footprint. And then the third one means basically that they are no longer holding the operating reserves requirement and that interruptions are imminent. Um, and just one quick clarification in any, basically whether it's um, an individual balancing authority or a region, uh, you have to have operating reserves. And operating reserves are really there so that if in fact you're running full out and you lose the largest generating unit, the system will collapse unless there's enough resources basically to pick up that difference. So the operating reserves in SVP amount to in effect one and a half times the largest resource or in effect the largest resource plus 50% of the next largest resource uh, that might go off so that in fact, if something did happen, then you've got the ability to maintain service to all customers. If not, frequency will drop and the system would likely collapse. Um, so that's a very quick uh, view of kind of put, laying the stage for Jason and Paul's discussions. Um, during the event uh, or during the two days that we had the interruptions, many of you actually agreed to run generation uh, in order to basically assist and relieve, relieve load on the system. We have those agreements. It's a voluntary arrangement. We do appreciate that. We appreciate folks that backed off the load uh, at the time to make sure that we can maintain the system as reliable as we could. Uh, and we appreciate the patience everybody had for the process. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Jason for the first part of the discussion about the event. Okay, excellent, thank you, Kevin. Mark and I tested this extensively before the call, sharing my screen. We'll see if I can actually pull it off now. Okay, did it work and is it sharing? Yes. Okay, excellent. So again, thank you, Kevin. My name is Jason Fortick. I'm the Vice President of the Power Supply Division for Lincoln Electric System. Uh, we have a number of responsibilities, uh, but as it relates to this type of information, the, probably the most important ones are the generating assets that LES has that we're responsible for, uh, contracts, operations, maintenance, those types of things. And then we have a group in our area that does market functions. So that'd be like wholesale activities like what Kevin mentioned with uh, the Southwest Power Pool. So this information that we're sharing today is, is largely the same information that we shared at our February board meeting. Uh, but maybe as you can probably understand, there's been new and updated information that we've gotten access to since then. So some of the slides are updated from what we shared at the board meeting. If you'd happen to go back and look at some of those slides that were made available. So, you know, of course the story here is the cold temperatures. The, the extremely cold temperatures caused increases in energy consumption. You know, for our industry, that was of course electricity. 
but then also increases in energy consumption on the natural gas system. And that, of course, placed some constraints on how much natural gas was available to deliver. This map here on the upper left uh, indicates just, you know, just how extreme these, these temperatures were in a lot of areas, either meeting or exceeding cold temperature records that had been established before. And then you'll see in a little bit later map, but if you look at this footprint and the area where these cold temperatures were occurring, this landed largely right on top of the SPP footprint. And I think Paul might actually have a, a slide in this presentation that puts that into more graphic detail. But the point is, you know, we're, we were in the middle of this cold area and it was causing a significant increase in the amount of electricity consumption by our customers and then also natural gas usage uh, by natural gas customers. So this extra demand placed on the natural gas system, of course, made natural gas prices rise. This chart here shows natural gas prices going back to the beginning of February. And a, you know, a couple things I wanted to point out, um, natural gas prices on average for monthly averages throughout the year of 2020 never exceeded $3 in MMBTU. And this blue line down at the bottom here, this is our budget line for the month of February, we're expecting natural gas prices to average about $2.90 in MMBTU. Well, you can see from this chart, those natural gas prices well exceeded you know, anything we had budgeted for, anything we'd experienced in the last several years. We saw natural gas prices rise over the weekend into the 154, almost $155 in MMBTU range. You know, and then by the 17th of the month, approaching $190 in MMBTU, which is just, I mean, it's just really kind of hard for us to comprehend how large that was. We kind of went through our collective memories here and the last time we could come up with anything that was even close was just shortly after the SPP market started back in 2014. There were some equipment failures on the natural gas system and we saw prices get into the $40 in MMBTU range. You know, and at that time we thought that was just a you know, a really large, really high price, you know, and here in our area, we saw these prices upwards, you know, of $150. One thing that's interesting to note is the natural gas day and the prices for the weekends typically settle for, you know, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, uh, so that you know what your prices are going to be for those weekend days. Well, this happened to also be a holiday uh, weekend with Monday being President's Day. So when gas prices were settling for Saturday, they were also settling for Monday and then into Tuesday. So we had four days that settled in this $155 and MMBTU range. So that locked in those high prices for an extended period of time. And then of course that landed right on top of the cold weather events that we were experiencing. So there's a very strong correlation between natural gas prices and electricity prices. And this chart here depicts uh, what's called the day ahead price for electricity in SPP. That's the orange set of bars or set of lines. And then the blue set of lines, those are real time prices. And so like the name implies, day ahead prices give you some indication of what the market is expecting you to do and how you expect your units to perform and what your load will cost on a day ahead basis. But then the real time prices take into account deviations that occur uh, in the real time. Loads might not be what you actually expected. Your generation doesn't run like you expected. So there are two different market prices. So I, I think that you know, the important thing to point out here is we had average prices for 2020 for uh, both day ahead and real time prices that were somewhere in the $20 and MMBTU range. And if you look at the scale on this chart, you know, we're seeing prices that are in the $2,000 to $4,000 a megawatt hour price range for our Lincoln loads and our Lincoln generation. So just really, really high prices, like nothing we had ever experienced before. And again, with that strong correlation between natural gas prices and electricity prices, that's a big driver in why electricity prices got so high. Another thing I wanna point out, I tried to use a common theme here with these white rectangles around the two days where we had the curtailment events, the 15th being the Monday when we had curtailment events, and then the 16th being the Tuesday. So I tried to use that theme throughout this report so you can kind of orient yourself on the days that we were having those 
really high prices and then also you know the curtailment events that were unfortunately occurring for our customers. So this next slide, uh, this gives you some indication of like what Kevin mentioned, the SPP footprint stretching all the way from the Canada border down into the northern parts of Texas. And then this is a map that SPP actually runs on their website uh, all the time. You can go to the SPP website and it'll show you what the footprint map of real time prices are. And I threw in this map on the left here to show maybe something of a more typical day when you would have congestion in the footprint. Each of the different colors represents a different LMP or a different locational marginal price for electricity. And depending on what the loads are on the system and what generation is available, uh, what constraints are occurring on the transmission system, you would typically see some type of congestion and then some type of variation in prices with the, you know, the blue and the cooler colors being lower prices and then the red, oranges and reds being higher prices. Well, when we got into these cold weather event days, the map of the footprint looked more like what you see on the right here, where you had essentially the whole footprint in the very highest price ranges. And if you, if you had happened to go to the uh, SPP website and look at the scale on this, this red color uh, is prices that are at or above $600 a megawatt hour. Uh, and so like I showed from my previous slide, we were well above that. So their scale was you know, well below even what the, the actual prices were showing up for some of those days in the real time market. Kevin touched a little bit on the energy emergency alert levels. So I wanted to step you through here uh, what we were experiencing from a natural gas infrastructure perspective, and then also some of those energy emergency levels that we were seeing from SPP. So natural gas, like I mentioned, a lot of demand on their system, placing a lot of uh, constraints on their system. They had actually declared a natural gas critical day, which is when they're experiencing some extreme strain on their system. Uh, operating conditions are you know, potentially impacting the integrity of service to customers. It went so far as for some areas that natural gas industry actually uh, declared it a force majeure event. So that means that even customers that have firm natural gas transport uh, potentially could have had those deliveries limited. So again, a very severe event driven by the cold temperatures, a lot of demand for both electricity uh, and generators burning natural gas to produce electricity. But then of course, you know, homes, businesses, other customers using natural gas in their processes or for heating. And so as you went through the day, you know, I've kind of stepped through here how SPP went through their energy, emer energy uh, emergency alert levels, you know, level one up through level three, those level three events, those are where the uh, SPP and their reliability coordination function are allowed and actually required to ask for curtailment of customer load if the events are that significant. And so then you can see how, how those lined up with the actual curtailment events that we had with reaching the EEA level threes late morning on Monday. And then we had the curtailment starting, uh, you know, just shortly after that and, or, you know, noontime early into the afternoon. And then on Tuesday, the curtailments occurring starting quite early actually Tuesday morning. And I think Paul is gonna get into a little bit in that in more detail. Um, just one funny story I wanted to share, you know, a lot of times this stuff is happening behind the scenes. Um, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of talk about natural gas event days or critical days, energy, emer energy emergency alert days. One of my coworkers said uh, that they went home and their spouse actually was reporting to them uh, what energy emergency energy emergency alert level we were in, and then also what the SPP footprint looked like. So some of this stuff went from being pretty secure to all of a sudden people's spouse watching it very closely and paying attention to what type of alert level we were in. So Paul is gonna to touch on this a little bit more, but this again is something that we shared with our board. It's a map of the locations across our service area where we uh, implemented those managed outage instances. The blue sections on here, those are curtailment areas that occurred on Monday. And then the orange areas on this map, those are curtailment areas that occurred on Tuesday. Um, again, that EEA3 level was the trigger for initiating some of those curtailment events. Um, again, Paul's going to jump into a little bit more detail, but I think the total number of customers 
was about 47 to maybe 48,000 customers impacted. Uh, on Monday, they requested that we curtail about nine megawatts of load, which is just a little bit under 4,000 customers. And then on Tuesday, in a couple different events, uh, they got up to asking us to curtail about 38 megawatts of load. So something around 44,000 customers. And just to put that into perspective, our all time peak summer load is about 786 megawatts. And we happen to set a new winter peak load during this time period of about 624 megawatts. So just to give you some perspective on the, the magnitude of curtailment that we're asking us to, to, to uh, place on our system. So as you can imagine, there have been a lot of questions about how did LES's resources perform during this event? And then also what was happening across the entire SPP footprint and how those resources were performing. So this chart shows the few days of the event for LES's local natural gas resources. And again, I've highlighted those curtailment days, the 15th and the 16th here with the white boxes. This top set of uh, kind of orangish yellow lines, that's our Terry Bundy generating site on the northeast part of town. The blue is our Rokeby generating site on the southwest part of town. And then the green line here is our J Street facility in the downtown area. And so as you can see, all of those units were being called upon to operate. Uh, J Street, we actually were you know, bringing back into service right in the height of the curtailment events. Some people have asked, you know, why is the output from the units bouncing around? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons, some of which is that although you know, the, the footprint was asking for as much generation as it could handle, in the real time, the market is also dispatching our units. So we are getting signals from the SPP market to dispatch our units to accommodate the changes in other generation and load across the footprint. So although it might be you know, kind of pleasant to see if you just had your units set at a constant output like we did here at J Street, well, that might not have been what the units were actually being requested to run at because of market dispatch. And operating a market dispatch is something that we're obligated to do because of our arrangements with SPP. We also have other types of resources, coal-fired resources. We have our wind portfolio and then some hydro resources. So this is a chart of those resources and how they were performing. Um, as you can see, our coal resources actually performed quite well. If you add up all of our coal resources, it's just under 400 megawatts of coal resources that we have. And from time to time, they were running you know, right at that maximum output level. But once again, the market was dispatching us. So just because they weren't running at their full output level doesn't mean there was necessarily a problem with the unit. It means that the market was dispatching us at something different. And during this time period, with just a few exceptions for some minor transmission constraints, all of our coal resources were available to operate. So as the market was dispatching them, for the most part, they were able to comply with those dispatch instructions. This wind output, you can see how that varies. Uh, in general, the wind is allowed to operate and produce at whatever the prevailing wind conditions are. So unless there are constraints on the system, uh, the wind generally gets the ability to produce at whatever its capability is, depending on what the wind speeds are. So this is, this is also just a representation then of what wind speeds and what wind was available in the footprint uh, and our resources available to run during this time period. So any variability you see there uh, is either due to there just not being the wind blowing or some of these units during that time actually had some impacts from the cold weather. A little bit of icing occurred for a while, but that was resolved fairly quickly. Uh, and then unfortunately we did have one of our uh, projects that we have a contract with, they had a circuit breaker that had a problem. And so that took out a few of the turbines that are in that facility. And then this chart, um, Kevin alluded to this also about our generation performing quite well and, and in general producing more energy than what our load was consuming. The blue lines in the back, that was the generation production from all of our resources. And then this orange line, that's LES's load. So with a few exceptions, uh, in general, LES's generating fleet produced more energy than what our load was consuming. And that, of course, was you know, a very good thing for the, for the footprint in terms of reliability, because we were able to help keep the system reliable, make more resources available. But then also it will be a financial benefit to us because if the load is experiencing very high prices, you know, to, to 
purchase load in the market, well, then your generation is also experiencing most likely very high prices and creating a lot of revenue. So if we were able to produce more energy than we were consuming, and it's collecting some of those very high market prices that you saw in an earlier slide, that has a positive impact on us financially because we're able to produce energy and create more revenue than what our load costs were incurring at the time. So um, there have also been a lot of questions, as you can imagine, over the last several weeks about what was happening in the footprint. I would expect this type of information to be analyzed and reanalyzed and lots of questions going on for you know, weeks or months or maybe longer. But we did pull, some together, pull together some information to try to give you a little bit of an overview of what resources we're producing and in what magnitudes across the entire footprint. And so we've got them labeled here. You've got coal in the blue, uh, section of these bars producing at a pretty consistent level throughout that whole week and then also during the you know the two curtailment events you had a pretty significant portion of the total energy being produced coming from natural gas resources uh, the hydro and nuclear resources uh, generally perform pretty consistently you'll see on a later slide here uh, nuclear is actually very consistent in its output and then wind varied again largely because either the wind was or was not blowing or some type of icing or maybe other cold weather impacts to the equipment. And then on this next slide, I want to zoom in and show the production during those two EEA3 events. So we looked at the footprint production for energy during those two events, you know, the one in the noon time on February 15th, and then the one later early in the morning on the 16th. And so this gives you a, a you know, an idea of what resources were serving the load in the footprint during those events. And so if you add up, you know, the coal production and the gas production, and you've got in the neighborhood of 75% of the energy being served in the footprint coming from coal and natural gas resources, wind comprising about 13%, and then smaller components from the nuclear fleet, hydro resources, diesel, and then you know, just a very small component from solar. And it's important to realize when you look at this information, there are different amounts of total generation from each of these resources in the footprint. You know, so just because you see a higher or a lower percentage here, uh, you know, you also have to take into account how much of that generation, how many megawatts of capacity of that type of generation are installed in the footprint to kind of give you some idea of whether or not that resource was performing well or not performing well during the cold weather event. And, and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate in these next couple slides. So these slides also look at that, you know, the cold weather event and highlighting the two days when the temperatures were so cold and we went into the curtailment events. This is a representation of these resource types capacity factors down to an hourly level. So we shrunk down the amount of time that we do that calculation to an hour so that you can, you know, for, for practical purposes, you can say, this percentage shown on this chart represents how much of that type of resources, uh, how much of that type of resource that's in the footprint was producing at that time. So, you know, what you see is on the nuclear resources, well, they were producing at essentially 100% of their output during that whole time period. Coal, you know, varied somewhere between, you know, the, the mid 60s or low 60s, almost up to 80%. Uh, so it performed quite well, all the resources that are in the footprint performing, you know, somewhere in that 70% range. But again, you got to keep in mind that just because it varied a little bit, that doesn't necessarily mean there were problems with the equipment. The market might have been dispatching them at different levels, which accounts for some of those changes, you know, although there also could have been maintenance or other outage factors. Hydro resources, they tend to vary as you know, water is available, but you do see a pretty steep uptick in hydro output. And that tends to coincide uh, almost exactly with when the need was the greatest for generation to cover some of those EEA level three events. And then other uh, components in the footprint, this top set of charts, this shows the natural gas production uh, in the footprint and then the wind production and you can see the numbers here are a little bit lower, you know, natural gas hovering in that maybe 30% production across the footprint. You know, this of course, uh, something that we'll need to be looking at as an industry. There's a, there's a pretty large 
amount of megawatts of natural gas resources in the footprint. So, you know, for only 30% of them to be producing, that's representative of those issues that were caused by the cold weather, you know, natural gas being not available or equipment unable uh, to handle some of the cold temperatures. So as an industry, I would expect we'll need to be looking at what can we do to improve that performance. And then on the wind uh, resource perspective, you know, you see the variation that we've been talking about. A lot of this, again, due to, you know, whether the wind was blowing or not. And then, of course, what the wind was doing uh, to help out the footprint during those time periods. You know, you're looking at maybe like something around 15 to 20 percent of the wind in the footprint producing during those coldest periods. And then diesel is not actually something that we talk about too much in the footprint. It's actually a relatively small number of megawatts available in the footprint, but it got called into service wherever it was available and could produce. And of course, was getting called upon to produce, you know, during those curtailment events, uh, any generation that was available, SPP was requesting us to make those available, run them at their maximum available outputs and uh, just do anything we could to help support the system. And so that actually takes me, that's, that's my last slide. Um, I will end there. And I think Mark, you wanted to uh, transition over into Paul's presentation now. Actually, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Paul really quick. He okay. is uh, Vice President of Energy Delivery here at LES, and he's going to briefly discuss uh, what happened on our local distribution system. All right, thank you, Lisa. Can you see my slide? Uh, no, we still see Jason. There we go, there we now go. we do. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Jason's gotta get trained on Zoom here. <laughs> it's all good, so thanks. <laughs> So like Lisa said, I'm Paul Chris, Vice President of Energy Delivery, and I'm going to go through just kind of briefly what we saw locally um, from our control rooms and what we did for interrupting customers at the uh, request of SPP in order to meet some of our load shedding requirements. So one of the things I just want to show, just kind of give you a high level overview of what was going on, and Jason covered a lot of this. With the cold weather event, we were um, seeing stuff being prepared. And as Jason said, a lot of this stuff was going on even in the weekend. But the main thing I wanted to highlight here from this SPP slide was the load shedding event days on the 15th and 16th and the percentages of load shed that they were requesting. And also just to kind of paint the picture and Jason mentioned this a little bit as well, the SPP region you can see covers a lot of the mid part of the US. And as you can see, that was in a very cold temperature area, and that helped play into the reasons for the load shedding event and the curtailments. <clears throat> Not going to cover this. You can kind of figure out from um, other discussions why we were in this um, situation. And to start with, one of the things that we have is Kevin mentioned even earlier that we're part of the SPP region. And we all kind of share into some of the responsibilities. And when we do get into a load shedding event, um, LES has a, a requirement to help with shedding 1.36% of the total megawatts or the total load of the region. And when you look through some of these other ones on the chart, you can see some other utilities had a pretty high level responsibility to shed. And LES, again, was down at a fairly low level, but still it impacts our customers locally. I'm not gonna go through the, the step by steps here. Jason had that on his slide. Probably the big thing though, like the EEA2, the energy emergency alert level that Jason referenced, that was the first time in an 80 year history for SPP that occurred. Um, at this point, I will say our control room started to um, put together some documentation and starting to track stuff of what we were doing as far as public appeals and trying to get customers alerted to a possible um, event, anything else going on. And then at 10.08, as Jason mentioned, we hit the first time in the 80 year history of that load shedding for firm load. So by the time there was, our, our control room was scrambling to try to get our plans together that we practice on tabletops um, every year. The operators go through a lot of training to get this ready. So they were trying to put together the list of circuits or areas of town where we could shed the load. But the big point here is we do not know how much load we have to shed until SPP gives us that, that amount. So at 1204, 
Um, SPP came up that throughout the region, they wanted 610 megawatts of load to be shed. And of that portion, LAS had to shed nine megawatts of load. So at that point, we have a, a regulatory requirement to shed that load as quickly as we can. So that's when you saw that first load shed on that day, and it was only nine megawatts, which we, again, we have no idea how much they're gonna ask us to shed and what they need. So that was something that we tripped out those couple of areas of town that Jason mentioned, and I'll show a little bit more again here later. And then that event lasted about an hour. So I will say after that time, after going through this the first time, even on Monday, we all regrouped. We heard customers, you know, calling in, requesting, how can we get better notification and what's going on? So we kind of put together an outage map to try to predict where things would be. And on the next day, I'll kind of talk about that a little more. Um, when you look at the areas of town, these are essentially broken down by our feeder breakers um, throughout town. You can kind of see at that 12 o'clock, 12, 11 hour, we had to have nine megawatts. And then as we restore that load to those customers, we all we have to drop other customers before we do that because we always have to be at that load shed amount that the SPP directs us to be at. So when you see this uptick, that's because we shed another essentially nine megawatts of load in order to restore the customers that we um, de-energized the first go round. I know Kevin briefly talked on this when we talk about the system, um, we need to maintain that frequency. Otherwise the system starts getting into its own automatic uh, load shedding events. And the frequency, the chart on the top kind of highlights where the frequency was at during this event. And down below, we kind of zoom in just because there wasn't much movement there. And then these other charts here, we have relays in our system that will automatically start dumping load without any operator intervention at 59.3 Hertz. And then again at 59 and 58.7. And that's 10% of our load at each of those steps. And that's when Kevin talked about if the system starts getting into such a dire straits and we can't do any manual interruptions, the system essentially takes over and starts uh, shedding the load as it needs to, to try to keep a total collapse from occurring. So one thing I did wanna say on the February the 16th, early Tuesday morning, we did have one of our uh, polls fell on us, which caused a fairly large outage out at 3rd and Van Dorn. And I know a lot of people thought this was another rolling blackout at that time, but that was just a normal outage. But we were dealing with that at 5.33 in the morning. And then as, Ke or as Jason mentioned too, that six o'clock or 6.15 is when we received another EEA3 alert level. So we had to start gearing up for that. And the interesting thing, we were all prepared through the night of being ready to shed chunks of load at nine megawatts. And we had our first uh, four chunks of nine megawatts worth of load that we thought we'll notify customers, we'll get this information out there, we'll kind of phase this in. We developed an outage map to give people some kind of forewarning that they're gonna be next on the list. And as you can see at 652, we got our load shed amount and it happened to be 19 megawatts, which was essentially twice what we had the day before. So we quickly moved through our first two blocks that we thought we could give people some advance notice. And then about 30 minutes later, SPP came back and told us we needed to shed another 19 megawatts. So 38 megawatts of load, um, Again, like I said, we had this four blocks of nine megawatts that we thought we were really prepared for. And we essentially went through that in our first set of interruptions. And then once we go through from 725 into 1015, we're trying to rotate those loads around the city. As most of you know, we were trying to stay within that, you know, 45 to an hour time frame. And just to let you know, when you look at the number of circuits there that we were interrupting, you can see it was quite a number of areas of town. Again, I, I will highlight, these are a lot of the feeder breakers. We do have the capability to, to essentially dump a whole substation if the request is so large and we just need to get that load um, off the system. But we were able to do more of a surgical approach here with essentially branch feeders, if you wanna call it, or branch circuits like you'd find in your main panels at your house or in your businesses. And you can see the number of circuits and as the control room was trying to move around and trying to find these circuits and maintain this 38 megawatts of load throughout that whole event, you can see there was a lot of uh, interruptions going on, a lot of documentation trying to keep track of this. And 
there's a lot of circuits that we have the remote capabilities to interrupt, but we also have to do some manual interruption. So we're actually sending some field crews to different substations throughout the city to actually open those breakers when the control room said, we need the more load, interrupt it, dump that, so then they can restore somewhere else. And then those, those uh, techs would essentially wait at that sub for that one hour of that outage and then possibly move on to the next substation to help out there. Again, the frequency event, you can see here, we really didn't get into that with the activity. You can see the chart and some of the frequencies when you zoom in a bit, when they called for some of the interruption, you do see a little bit of a, a change in the frequency, but nothing that got to the, the automatic under frequency load shedding. So one thing I want to show, this is something we put together to highlight um, the outage areas and how this occurred. And I, I do apologize, this kind of goes in 15 minute chunks of when we were dumping load. And if you look at the bottom of the chart here, once it pops up, um, you can see the load of Lincoln. So at the bottom, that's the Lincoln load. And when we get to the events, like at 1215, you can see the two areas of town there that we interrupted. And this was for that first day where we were just for an hour. But as Kevin even mentioned, some of you that curtailed load, you can see we started at about 620. And by the end of this event and even onto the day, we were down to 585 when we were back to our normal. So the shedding in this in the area helped out. And then on Tuesday, the, the morning where we started tripping a lot of areas, you can kind of see where our load was at in the bottom. And then up above is, again, you can see the areas of town that we were interrupting. And I will say, just for people's information, we were trying to break it up by north, south, east, west to spread out where these outages were occurring. We weren't trying to pick on any one area. Um, and we were, again, we had that outage map on our website to give people that advanced notice of here's the area we're interrupting now and here's the future one to try to help with that customer interaction. And I think we got a lot of positive feedback on that. Um, but again, uh, it was a kind of a learning on the fly since we have not actually done this. We've just done a lot of tabletops. So we made, again, some improvements as we went through that event and then we'll continue to make improvements. This is a map that Jason said, just to kind of give you a static showing of where the areas of town were that we interrupted. Um, and the, the other part um, that we talk about the rest of the days, you know, kind of calmed down, things got back to more normal. Um, but during these events, I did want to highlight, we do have critical loads that we identify. And when we say critical loads, we're thinking about the hospitals, water pumping stations, um, sanitary lift stations, all those things that are more of critical to the welfare and safety of the public. So we do have those identified or we try to identify those on an annual basis. Um, one thing we quickly found out on this one or on this event, there's a lot of surgical centers that have opened up around town that we're probably gonna go back and do a deeper dive on that just to make sure that we're not interrupting a surgery center throughout the city. And, you know, again, we're trying to make improvements as we go along as well and trying to improve some of that communications that we can do along the way. When we gave this presentation to our board, there were a couple of questions like how many feeders did we actually go through and where did we end up at? So when we think about it, we have 36 um, serve or load serving substations throughout the city. They're about spaced two miles apart from each other. And from there, we have about 182 feeders. These are those individual branch feeders that go out into the surrounding neighborhoods that are serving load. And then we had about 28 feeders currently that are identified with critical load. So we tried to avoid those 28, but some of you may um, understand as well too, we're constantly switching our, our feeders around or the open points we call them when we're doing road construction or we need to de-energize a section of line. So during this event, we were trying to hit all these real time and capture those to make sure we didn't miss anything. So that was something that we learned as we went through these events. So as you kind of work down through that, essentially we end up then with excluding those critical loads, about 154 feeders that we could start interrupting load and 49 of those were utilized during this event. So we, we still could have went through quite a few more um, events, but Again, we have to maintain that, that 38 megawatts of load in this event. And we look at how much load is currently on those feeders real time, because that's where we have to meet our regulatory re 
requirements is what's on there and how much load did we trip out when we shut those feeder breakers off. And then I, I mentioned that under frequency load shedding earlier, we have about 61 feeders that are part of that under frequency load shedding. And that's what's used for when the system gets into a really dire strait and, and we need to do something automatically. So when we're doing these manual load shedding events, we definitely you know, try to avoid those. Originally, I thought we had to for the requirements, but the requirements have been updated um, to say, essentially try to avoid those at all costs. But if you have to start interrupting your, your circuits identified, you can. But those were kind of the things that we were, we were going through in the control room and interrupting the loads. And you know, like Kevin said, we appreciate everything people have done and helping out with that load shedding. So with that, I am at the questions stage. Mark? Yes, we do have. If you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to add a few other just quick facts. Um, so of the four key account reps, um, they actually handled during those days about 500 inbound and outbound calls um, to about 125 of, of our larger customers. Um, one of the more staggering uh, statistics is our outage map had over 120,000 hits during the two-day period. And our social media, which, um, you know, is, is there and we do, we have a great presence there, but isn't heavily used. We had um, 698,000 Twitter impressions, 139,000 Facebook post um, reaches, and this accounts for a 15,000% increase over what we normally see. So we learned from that that social media and um, our outage map really, really do work to, to reach our customers. Um, I did get one question that came just to me, Mark. So before mm -hmm. you start taking the ones that went to everyone, mm -hmm. um, we had the question, it was back on Jason's presentation and they asked how would, um, it was one of your uh, slides, Jason, that were talking about what, what the market was doing. How would it change if customers didn't um, reduce or didn't use their generation? Well, if, if, if there was, it, it, all of that adds up, every little piece helps. If they hadn't have used their generation, well, then you could have maybe seen that curtailment event come sooner because SVP is, you know, in real time balancing how much load there is to how much generation there is. So if customers hadn't run their generation, and I know that was occurring in other parts of the footprint, they just would have run out of generation sooner. And from SVP's perspective, it would have looked like the load was higher. So you could have had the curtailment event occur sooner. It could have been a, a bigger curtailment event. You know, so like for us, instead of asking for either the nine or the 38 megawatts, maybe they would have asked for something larger. And then, you know, that could have been impacted by all the other areas that were maybe also running customer generation if it was available. The total request to curtail across the footprint could have just been a larger number. Just to add on that, you know, since we had basically three different blocks, you know, in the winter, typically you have a morning peak and after or an evening peak. Uh, and so the blocks we'd set up to request uh, folks that were willing to run, if you think about it, we did not have to do interruptions in either evening period, either on Tuesday or when, I mean, Monday or Tuesday. And that's when you all were doing that. So it's likely that that had another way of assisting what Jason's saying is we were bringing load down overall in the footprint uh, to, you know, to take care of that. Um, a couple other things struck me. I wasn't sure that we talked about the magnitude of the number of customers we interrupted. Um, on Monday, total of 4,000. On Tuesday, it was a total of 43,000. As Paul said, it was an hour basically on Monday and three and a half hours on Tuesday. Um, and a couple other quick things. Uh, I know there has been one thing, one of the things posted about the outage map. You know, we have to have to admit we didn't have that in our pocket going into this event. Um, we, we have, you know, uh, like you all do, all these different plans. Paul referenced the fact that we drill the plan. We look at the circuits every year. We do these different things. But just like many of us experienced uh, a year ago, uh, we, many of us had significant pandemic plans too. Uh, I'm not sure whether the plan we had in place lasted much past uh, mid-March 
and we were kind of then operating on the fly and building a new pandemic plan. Uh, to some extent, our average plan was not quite like that, but we did learn a lot. Certainly the communications element is one of those, and we're gonna to continue to try to get better at that piece. Uh, fortunately for you all, you have account representatives that you know, keep that, uh, basically that communication up. I know in some cases, I even talked to some of, some of your companies as well uh, as we were going through that and people wanting to know what they could do to help. But we're gonna to try to get better and find other tools to do that better. Uh, staff deserves a great deal of credit in developing that enhancement to the outage map overnight because it did make a dramatic difference. And that is certainly something that we're going to keep. Uh, we're just gonna to hope to get better with the communications piece. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention that Jason talked about diesel and natural gas. You know, for us, we do keep some firm gas transportation, but it's not enough to support all the gas resources. But on the other hand, as LES has added generation over the years, we've typically built on in the footprint for natural gas dual fuel capability. And as many of you know, that's not necessarily uh, the standard, but what we've done is we do that because of reliability. In many cases, however, in this particular event, the first time in my 45 years in the industry, um, fuel oil was a more economic choice to run than natural gas. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting position to be in. And then finally, uh, maybe beating a question that, that may come up is what's the financial impact that we're gonna see out of this? Um, right now, uh, we believe we're gonna probably, you know, that we're gonna be break even or a little better. Um, and I, I'm cautious about how we, we've done evaluations on it. Uh, I'm very cautious because any of you that have been reading the Wall Street Journal, for example, know that there's lots of things going on, particularly in Texas now, but I don't know that it'll be limited to that. And looking at what happened in the markets, should there be some retroactive caps put in place? Um, quite candidly, I have no idea how you do a retroactive price cap and then try to figure out what would have happened if you hadn't done wherever the market was at that time. But because of that, we're very cautious about talking about, you know, kind of where we end up financially. We're pretty confident uh, that we'll be at least break even. And it's likely we're gonna be a little better than that because as we said, we were running generation at a time when it was needed and it was actually quite profitable. So we're working our way through that uh, and you know, we're gonna be having further discussions. But just as a reminder, it, those of you who remember the days of Enron, uh, it took until a few years ago. So it was like 10, 15 years before a lot of that Enron stuff settled. I don't anticipate that that's gonna happen here, but I don't think it's gonna be quickly. And I think there may be both government and regulatory intervention looking at, at this probably more predominantly in Texas than the SPP market, uh, but our markets went very high as well. So uh, just a few extra thoughts. So I have a question here from Kirk Conger at UNL, uh, actually a couple questions. Um, the first is will SPP or LES be under official pressure to add or maintain additional traditional generation by because of this event? That's the first question. So um, I, I'm interpreting that as basically an accredited capacity question. There are, there are rules in the SPP, well, for all the utilities, but rules in SPP about how much additional generating capacity you have to have. And it's a, it's a term called accredited capacity, which means the amount of generation that you can actually count on to produce when you are in your most extreme needs. Uh, a lot of that is accredited based on summer conditions, not necessarily winter conditions. So what, what I would expect out of this is there's probably going to be a, you know, a deep dive and a review on how each of us utilities are accrediting or would accredit our units for winter operations, you know, because clearly not all the units operated like you would have expected or maybe would have hoped when the temperatures got that cold. So um, I don't think we mentioned it, but SPP has launched an effort to do a deep dive and a lessons learned and, you know, basically just a very thorough analysis of all that this has occurred. And at one of the meetings that I participated with, their uh, chief operating officer said, that that's most likely something that's going to get looked at. How are units accredited or what are they rated for to run in winter or cold weather conditions in addition to summer conditions? Yeah, you know, and actually that's also the good point about that, that the uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission 
have also identified that they're going to be doing uh, a significant review of this. SPP has, and I think SPP had like eight segments that they were looking at different kinds of teams. Internally, we're doing something similar. Clearly, we believe that we performed well, but we want to get better. Um, the accreditation issue is somewhat interesting because, and, and just so everybody understands, you know, one of the questions that has been coming up is when didn't perform? Um, well, it's true to some extent it didn't perform as much as maybe you would have wanted. But, you know, if you look at, and, and the example I would use is we've got basically 100 megawatts of wind in Oklahoma, 100 megawatts in Kansas, and 100 in Nebraska. Um, one of those 100 megawatt increments is accredited to like 55, 60 megawatts. In other words, that's what it's accredited for because of its history of how it runs basically, as Jason said, on peak. We have others that own the other basically two blocks are only about 15 megawatts of accreditation for 100. So if, you're, if you have 100 megawatts of wind generation and you're only accrediting it for 15 megawatts, you really didn't have really high expectations for it to be operating during peak. Um, and we, in some of ours, were not operating at accreditation over that period. But it was also interesting when we did the those different contracts and we did them based on RFPs and bidding and financial, we, we actually thought having them in different regions was a good idea, both because of market differences uh, as well as the geographic differences. And we did see over that, those basically those few days where in some cases the wind in Oklahoma was running really well and nothing was happening in Kansas or Nebraska and vice versa. So there is something to be said for getting that geographic diversity as a part of our portfolio. Um, just as you might guess, there's an awful lot of complexities and we're trying to kind of boil it down so you all can have an idea and ask questions about what, what parts of that interest you. But um, there were a lot of pieces in play uh, as we went through that whole process. Robbie made the, uh, Robbie Swanson made the, the comment that the outage map was absolutely critical for their business um, and uh, greatly appreciated. They have many assets that cannot just lose power without being taken down properly. And we know there's a lot of customers in our serve territory that, that are in that similar situation. Um, Jim Hines uh, asked, um, do you have any information about how public utilities manage these events compared to investor-owned utilities? Um, any thoughts about public versus investor-owned in terms of their performance? I don't think we've had, you know, seen enough information on that. Um, we do know, you know, Nebraska itself is an all-public power state. Um, you know, the three major utilities in Nebraska all performed well. Net Nebraska was a net exporter into the market uh, during the significant parts of the event. Um, so, but at this point, I don't think there's been enough information provided for us to know exactly what the experience was. What I do think was obvious, however, is if you, if you looked at Texas, which was the, you know, in effect, a retail competition market, and that goes back you know, quite a ways, um, you can see there, and by the way, I should say in ERCOT, where Jason mentioned, we're required to have our load plus a certain amount of reserves in order to participate in the market and be able to do that. That is not a requirement in Texas. There is no reserve requirements. Um, there were no requirements for folks to weatherize their generation. There's no requirements for them to have dual fuel capability. So all of those things, you know, there were many things that stacked up to cause how bad that event hit Texas, uh, but certainly their market, the lack of basically reserve requirements, all of those things came into play. This kind of segues into the next question. Um, in Elias's opinion, what would have changed if Southern Texas would have been part of SPP? Would have that been good or bad for Nebraska? Well, there, uh, I'll take a crack at that. There, there would have had to been, to make a meaningful impact, there would have been some significant changes to the way the transmission system works down at the Texas, in the ERCOT, the Texas and SPP border. Uh, they are in a different, what's called electrical interconnection than SPP or the Eastern interconnection. So there are very limited transmission ties and very limited transmission transfer capability between the ERCOT region or most of Texas and SPP. So even if they had been a, you know, a member, whatever, you know, take quite a bit of change to get that to occur. But even if they had been a member, unless there was a lot of transmission investment to improve the and increase the capability to flow power 
between the SPP north footprint and then what would be an SPP south footprint. There's just not a lot of capability for energy to flow down into Texas from SPP. So taking a guess at it, I wouldn't have think there'd been a, a huge impact uh, if they had been, unless that transmission capability was dramatically increased. But it may have helped them a lot if they'd been required to have reserves. So. Right. There's a question about thoughts about the impact of LES pushing or incentivizing customers to go with all electric heat, especially in the residential sector, as the natural gas system did not seem to require outages or curtailments. Um, and we're actually, I don't believe we're in the position right now, at least, where we're pushing for fuel switching by customers who currently have natural gas. Um, we certainly promote the efficiencies of heat pumps, um, but um, is there any thoughts about, about um, I guess, hypothetically, um, any implications about pushing for electrification within the service territory? Well, I well, think, oh, I'm sorry, Jason, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, you know, I think one of the things is I tried to start out when we were talking about the decarbonization goal is our goal is as we move toward that, that we're gonna make sure we're maintaining the reliability that's required to support whatever our loads are at that time. And, you know, that's you know, a large part of that, you know, one year of working with the board before they considered where they wanted to go on a goal was to discuss the importance of reliability, all of the impacts that come about, you know, with that and the responsibilities. Uh, so I would say that as we're moving toward more electrification and, you know, we, we see it on a gradual basis for, in different areas, for example, transportation, transportation yeah. you know, we're gonna continue to maintain that same commitment to maintaining reliability regardless of where that load is. But as we also all know, as technology has dramatically improved, you know, conservation, efficiency has made huge differences as we add load already. So uh, I, I'm confident that we will continue to maintain our reliability uh, metrics and that's gonna be our, our continued goal. And you all know that that's one of those things that we have some of the highest reliability in the country and we're proud of it and we plan on maintaining it. Here's a question about how the landfill methane gener generators participated during this event, knowing that it's just a very tiny part of the total but was there any impact from the, the extreme cold on the operation of the landfill gas uh, uh, units? Yeah, that, that was kind of a choice I made. I could have included the landfill uh, generation output on the charts. I didn't just because it's a relatively small component. Um, they performed really well, uh, <laughs> but interesting story, you know, Paul mentioned about not having done this before and learning about our system one of the circuits that actually was interrupted during the curtailment was one of the supply circuits to some cleaning equipment that we have for the landfill gas generation. And so for a short amount of time, we actually did take the landfill gas generation offline because we turned off that cleaning skid equipment. Now, as soon as the power was restored and we were able to start the equipment back up, landfill performed well. So if it hadn't have been for the electrical outage, the landfill gas units performed really quite well. Here's a good question from Dan Beecher. Um, how will LES reconcile the net zero carbon goal, which will be the subject of our next business advisory council, but how will LES reconcile the net zero carbon goal with the fact that the majority of net zero generation is not a guaranteed resource, was not able to support the cold weather event? Well, I think that's part of the transition. Um, you know, we're actively engaged, for example, in looking at hydrogen as a fuel that can displace natural gas. Uh, we all know that nuclear small module reactors are, you know, at least in the early stages of looking at uh, construction and deployment. So we still believe we have to have a diverse mix. It just may change on, on how the, the fuel sources as well as the technology we're using to get there. Uh, fortunately, you know, we've, we recognize obviously the weakness with respect to renewables, but we also recognize that, you know, some of that can be assisted by storage, not all of it, uh, but there are other technologies out there that may be in effect bridges so we can bridge from natural gas to hydrogen type of, of possibilities, as well as other mitigation that can even be done uh, on coal resources, whether in fact uh, carbon sequestration and storage becomes an option or not. 
That segues a little bit into Aaron Evans' quest, couple of questions, really good questions. Um, with the new data on how the SPP per, uh, system performed, do you anticipate that energy storage could become a higher priority for LES or SPP to increase reliability and promote decarbonization goals? That was the first question. And then the other is, was transmission con excuse me, was transmission congestion a factor during the event that would limit the benefit of these systems? So, um, you know, in my opinion, if, if, if technology advances such that really large scale, uh, industrial scale energy storage becomes a reality, you know, both in terms of technical feasibility and financial feasibility, I really think that's a game changer, you know, because you're essentially taking what's an intermittent resource that, you know, you're kind of subject to, you know, literally whether the wind is blowing or the sun is shining and turning that into something that you can dispatch just like we prefer with, <clears throat> prefer with all of our traditional resources. So if that becomes viable, that's a, that's a really big deal for the industry. You know, right now, the, the trouble is the scale is just not there. You know, you, you would need uh, storage projects that are considerably larger in terms of megawatt capability, but then also a lot longer energy storage. You know, right now, the you know, kind of the state of the art is maybe four hour batteries, maybe up to eight hour batteries. You know, to make it through an event like this, we're talking about, you know, days of storage needed. And then, of course, you've got to figure out where that energy is going to come from. You know, if we're short on producing energy in the footprint, well, you can't put energy into a battery or some other storage device if you're not producing the energy to begin with. So there would have to be a significant build out of resources available to produce the energy and then some pretty significant improvements in the storage technology. But if you look at the curves at how that technology is evolving, uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if you know you see over the next several years some really large advancements in the capability of, of energy storage, and that would be a, a really big change and a really big benefit to our industry. Do you also want to talk about, Jason, uh, any impacts from transmission congestion that we saw during these couple days? Yeah, well, I, I just briefly touched on it. Um, we did experience a little bit of transmission congestion in the western part of the state and then uh, into Wyoming, where we have one of our coal plants. Um, that transmission congestion limited the capability for that plant to produce, but a, a very small amount of congestion. There was also, you know, you might, if you see some of the stuff at the, you know, the committee hearings and things like that, there was some congestion for flows from the northern part of SPP down into the southern part of SPP. And, and like Kevin mentioned, you know, Nebraska in general was producing more energy than we were consuming. So that energy was trying to flow north to south uh, in some pretty large quantities. And so the transmission ties between Nebraska and Kansas uh, were basically getting used to their maximum capability. So. You know, it also wouldn't surprise me if out of this deep dive into what happened, there is some review of how much transfer capability, how much transmission capability there is at the Nebraska border uh, to see if some of those constraints can be eliminated. And I do not see any additional questions. Let's see. There's a lot of really kind uh comments being shared, um, really uh, not only how the LES um, system performed, but really appreciation for all the customers out there who helped, uh, whether it be just shedding load, shifting load, um, or being patient understanding during a, a pretty crazy and, and unprecedented time. Um, so um, we really appreciate all of the customers and, and, and all the roles that you played. Um, and before I turn back things over to Lisa to close things out. Um, I want to mention that uh, we do have a smart energy forum coming up next week, March 16th, um, which is going to focus in on customer owned backup generation. Uh, we, we discovered, and I think a lot of customers discovered that they didn't really think too much about backup generation during this time. And there really is a lot that goes into not just uh, if you're putting and installing backup generation, but the, the operations and the maintenance is really critical. Um, and particularly when you're dealing with such harsh weather conditions, um, 
so we uh, we have some experts that will be talking about that very subject. Um, and we did we sent some um, emails out uh, to a large group of folks that we felt would benefit from this. Um, but if you did not get it, uh, reach out to your account executive and we'll make sure we get you the registration link. Uh, that's next week, March 16th, Smart Energy Forum. And then, uh, as we've already kind of alluded to, we are going to focus the next Business Advisory Council in May uh, on the focus of the uh, net zero carbon goal that was established by the board um, and uh, get into some of the details of, about that as well. Um, so um, this, uh, uh, this, will, this dialogue, this conversation will, will continue. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Lisa to close things out. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, we appreciate everybody's time this morning. Um, we know that there was a lot of information to cover. If you think of questions after this meeting, be sure to reach out to your key account representative or any of us that were on this call, and we will try to answer your questions. Um, I do urge you to take the survey that Mark will be sending out to everyone um, at the close of this meeting, or knowing Mark, he may have very well already sent that out to everybody. 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> not yet? Okay. 10, um, minutes. Ten minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, again, thank you very much for participating, and we appreciate your time and look forward to meeting with you again in May. So have a great morning, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.